that tipping point is when those network effects uh, stop working against you and actually start working for you. The more people that have telephones, more people you can call, more people can call you. By definition, really, platforms have both demand and supply side network effects, and they have that cross side network effect uh, between those groups. Pleased to be joined by Nick Johnson, co author with me on, on Modern Monopolies. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, Alex. Great to have you back on the show. It's been a minute. A little, little pandemic interruption to our usual activities, but we're back at it. Let's talk about what network effects are. And and then I want to layer in aggregator theory. So, you know, I think when we when we think about the classic definition of network effects and what we have in the book, right, is we talk a lot about two-sided network effects. So you have a you have not one but two network effects. You have uh, demand and you have supply. We call them consumers and we call them producers, right? On the demand and on the supply side. And the whole idea is that as you build more demand, as you build more supply, you know, every additional user helps you gain another user. And eventually you hit this, this tipping point of critical mass. And that, you know, that tipping point is when those network effects uh, stop working against you and actually start working for you. They actually start helping you, right? Where the cost of of acquiring a new user is actually is actually becoming decreased because you have that critical mass, right? That just the power in the network alone creates value for uh, you know either a consumer or a producer or both to join the platform and join the ecosystem. What else would you add to that? Basically, a network effect. The basic idea is that there's an incremental benefit to any existing user for every new user that joins the network. That's it. Simply, basically there's increasing returns and increasing value to the people currently in the network. When more people join Uh, a simple example of that is like the telephone. The more people that have telephones, more people you can call, more people can call you. Uh, I think that there's typically, they talk about two kinds of network effects, direct and indirect. I think in practice, uh, direct basically means any user that joins the network is value to all other users. Indirect is typically what we talk about in the context of platforms where you have multiple sides and the more that join one side, the more it benefits the other side. So the more consumers you have, the more producers uh, that benefits and vice versa. I think in practice, almost all network effects in the context of platforms are indirect, even when you have ones where you have the same user like Facebook which often says that a lot of people say has direct network effects or an Instagram in practice, what it really is is people acting in different roles, even though it's the same person. And sometimes they're acting as a consumer and other times they're acting as a producer. And as the platform, they very intentionally cater to trying to get people to act in those different roles and provide tools to do so. Um, Hence why there's some confusion because it's the same person. So you just think direct network effects, but in practice and how the platform is actually designed, it's indirect and the same person acting in different roles. Can you have network effects only on one side of the platform? For example, can you have network effects only on the demand side of, I guess it's not a platform at that point, of your business? You, I mean, network effects can exist. Uh, an example would be like you know, Netflix. A lot of people talk about network effects of, Oh, the more people join, you know, the better data Netflix gets and the more better recommendations they can make. Curation, right? Where if you get more demand, more people clicking, you learn about their behavior and now you can better cater to that, to that demand audience. Something like that, right? I guess. Right. But in practice, if you're not a, if Netflix still, as we've talked about many times, not a platform business, by definition, really platforms have both demand and supply side network effects and they have that cross side network effect. Uh, between those groups. So let's let's talk about aggregation theory here. So aggregation theory, Ben Thompson, friend, smart guy. We agree on most things. I'd say on the sliver where we disagree would be around kind of his theory around aggregation theory and platform business models. You know, aggregation theory, the way I would describe it is basically discrediting the value of the supply side network effect, right? Where um, really, what he says is the value is being the aggregator of demand. And if you can be the aggregator of demand, that is the be all end all. If you can lock in demand and scale and scale demand, then what you're doing on the supply side is less important. 
Did I get that right? How would you describe it? Yeah, I think I think that's a fair assessment. I think my response to that would be that it depends very much on the market dynamics, meaning how many competitors you have, if any, and the stage of the market. I think in practice, you can see that you know, this theory doesn't play out. I mean, you see where most platforms actually competed typically is most aggressively on the supply side. Uber and Lyft giving thousands of dollars away in subsidies to drivers we were doing allegedly at least borderline illegal things to steal drivers from Lyft. Most platforms, particularly in the growth stage, when you have multiple competitors, are competing the most aggressively on the supply side, particularly when there's limited supply. And I think you know that point is key where Netflix is a great example of aggregator theory. It's not a good example of platform, as you're saying, right? And I think when, when you're talking about that competition... I'd say the dynamic of going back to network effects, you have two-sided network effects. You've got your demand and your supply side network effect. It's not solely about the demand side. Instead, what we're saying is these things feed off of each other, right? Yeah. And, and that's what you hear this chicken and egg problem, right? The chicken and egg problem is the classic platform problem. Every platform experiences this problem a myriad of times throughout its, its life cycle and, and its growth. At every every kind of threshold of scale the platform achieves, it kind of has yet another chicken and egg problem. Chicken and egg problem doesn't exist when you have a, a linear model which could which which could fit the aggregator theory model. Aggregator theory basically here's another way to think about it. Every platform doesn't fit aggregator theory, but every aggregator theory could fit a platform model right? Where aggregator theory isn't giving credence to the supply side. A platform could still fit aggregator theory, but the aggregator theory or what's considered an aggregator doesn't mean they're automatically a platform because of this supply side network effect dynamic. So you don't really have the chicken and egg problem in, in something like a Netflix because the supply side is not from third-party producers, right? That supply is actually on the balance sheet of the business, Netflix. That supply is not being contributed by a network or an ecosystem of third-party producers. And I think as you're, to your point, the challenge with that is that there's really a, a much smaller moat, a much smaller sense of defensibility, right? That's why, for example, Disney Plus in what, uh, six, eight months, has over 100 million subscribers. And it doesn't mean that they're beating Netflix, but you would never be able to see, you would never, like if you take YouTube, the platform equivalent of Netflix, you would never be able to see a competitor come in, a large incumbent, spend a few billion dollars and come in. We saw this with Microsoft trying to go after iOS and Android, right? Microsoft didn't hold a flame and there, there would not be a scenario where you could catch up relatively quickly to the dominant platform monopoly in a given space, let's say YouTube. Okay, another case in point of that would be what IAC did with Vimeo. They were, IAC understands platforms really, really well. Barry Diller, Expedia, Expedia's in Plat, Tinder, right? Uh, uh, Match Group, they have multiple platform, public platform businesses. They understand platforms really well. They tried to give YouTube a run for their money. What is Vimeo doing now? It's not a YouTube competitor because you, that dynamic of capturing that supply side network effect really gives the defensibility um, to this to the platform model. It helps protect the margins, the profit margins, the economics of the business. And I think it rolls directly into why you see, you know, these dominant platforms having the highest multiples on the market, including as compared to, you know, fast growing linear tech businesses, which could be a, a SaaS provider or it could be a, you know, a Netflix. But anything else you'd add to that? Yeah, I think a, a good recent example is Mixer with Microsoft. They couldn't compete with all the supply the Twitter, uh, sorry, Twitch had. They tried to buy a couple, but from there, basically, they're not getting all the supply, so the customers aren't showing up and vice versa. Uh, it's really both sides that defined it, not just that they couldn't get the customers. I think that's a great point. Um, Nick, you've got some work to do. We'll leave you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And, and hopefully we'll get, we'll get you in on more of these going forward. Always great to have you come on. Thanks, Alex. Hi, this is Alex from Winner Take All. Thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the content. Feel free to leave a comment, ask us questions, and definitely make sure to join us on our next live stream.